All right, we are in review for the parabola quiz that we're going to be dealing with tomorrow. So on these first four, we're going to graph the quadratic. So we'll do our normal thing there. And then we're going to tell the vertex, the axis of symmetry, if my graph shows a min or a max, woof, and domain and range. So the first part of this should be pretty easy. Okay, the vertex, it's in vertex form. What I've got to remind myself is opposite of h, so the opposite of 1 is negative 1, and then my k value is 2. Once I know that vertex value, Remember, we're looking for a couple of values, and some of you had even approached me. I'm not going to do it particularly on this sheet, but if some of you are worked, used to the whole left to right thing, and you wanted to make your chart and turn it this way and have X, Y, and go like this, there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually, if that's something that helps you, it's a wise thing to do. So if I'm going to do this this way, and I'm gonna pause. so once we're to here, We've talked before about how we want two values that are less than what's at my vertex and two values that are greater. But to get those values, I don't necessarily have to just plug these in manually, especially when we're in class taking a quiz and have a calculator for access. So I can go ahead and get that typed in. And once I do, I'm going to look at the chart and if I did my vertex right, I should see symmetry above and below my vertex. And I see the same numbers, I see the symmetry. So at this point, there's no trouble or no problem with just getting those values put in. So once I have that, And I get my points plotted. Again, we should be getting U shapes on these. If I get any other shape, that's, that's not doing me much good. So once I get that, now I can actually start getting my other information. My axis of symmetry is just the x value of my vertex. But I have to put the x equals with it. I can't just write negative 1. Negative 1's a number. That's not a line. It's not a point. It's just 1. So i got to put the x equals with it. Since my vertex is at the bottom of my graph, that's going to be a minimum. And then remember, domain and range. Domain is my x values from left to right, and this should be the easiest question every single time on a quiz with quadratics, because it's always the same answer. My range then, remember, is my y values from the bottom of my graph, so down here at y equals 2, to the top, and those arrows say it goes up forever. So really, the, the main thought is just getting that vertex value jotted down. Once I have that, the rest of it shouldn't be too hard to deal with. Now, number two is a little more interesting. Anybody care to venture a guess on what the vertex is for number two? Give it a go. Zero, three. Zero, three. And some of you are like, okay, now I kind of see where that could come from, but what's, okay, I don't see any parentheses. So the plus 3 would sort of be like my plus 2 is here outside the parentheses to be my y value. I could rewrite this if I wanted to, but I don't need to, if you want to look at it in vertex form. But typically, if I don't see the parentheses here with my squared, the x value of my vertex will be 0. So good, we can get that down there. So I could get my vertex into my chart. And just like before, I can plug the x values in. 
Or I can just pull up my calculator, go ahead, type in what I see, so the 2x squared plus 3, look at my chart and get my vertex into the middle of the chart so I see symmetry. And once I see that I have symmetry, I can put the rest of the values in. So for these first few, that's basically all I'm going to need the calculator for. It's just that one little spot. And get that drawn in. And now it's all the same info that I did on that first one. X equals the X value of my vertex. Okay, so X equals zero. Minera max. My vertex is at the top of my graph, so that would be a max. Domain is the same every time, so we really don't have to think about that a whole lot. And then again, range, be careful. It's bottom to top. Bottom in this case is down forever. So I'm going to start with negative infinity. But I don't go up forever. I only go up to this point, which would be 3. And that's all we've got when we're dealing with vertex form. Now life does get a little more interesting after this. There is a little more to think about. There's nothing wrong with that. So as we move down a little bit towards number three, I even starred this one because there's a couple of interesting twists we can get ourselves into here. So I look and I'm like, okay, can't take the vertex straight from what I see here. These are the ones where I jot down my A, B, and C values. And when I go to look for my X value... I remember, oh yeah, negative b over 2a, oh yeah. So, the opposite of b, the opposite of 6 is negative 6, over 2 times a. And here's where I've got to be a little bit cautious. Clean up the denominator first. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. And then we do negative 6 divided by negative 4, and this is not going to be a misprint. It's a fraction. It's a decimal. What do we do? Did I do something wrong? No. We did not. So we know our vertex x value is 1.5, which then gets us to our next probable dilemma. Because normally what Hardy tells us is, well, if you get, you know, once you get your X value, you can just go look at the chart. Problem. The chart doesn't do decimals. So did I just skip this one? No. Let's go to our other trick. Our buddy, the trace button. Because remember, if I just hit the trace button, once it graphs the parabola for me, and that little cursor guy shows up, there he is, I can type in... Any value I want for x, including decimals. So I type in the 1.5, and I hit enter, and it tells me the y value is 6.5. Now, is that going to solve all the world's problems? Not completely. Because even though I now have my vertex... Some of you now are going to seem puzzled and go, well, how am I going to graph the rest of this then? Because it's starting with a decimal. I'm still going to use the same rules that I've always used. I'm still going to minus 1 each time as I go left. In this case, I go up. And I'm going to add 1 each time as I go downward. Yeah. Oh, because I'm a bonehead. Thank you. They're like, see, this guy, he's making a video and he does goofy things. Why did you mention that before I went too much further? 
So it is now Hardy Whiteout time. And see, I don't do enough with video changing. People are like, why don't you just cut that part out? Because it lets you see that I even can mess some of this stuff up when I'm not being careful with things. So now that we're going to get the vertex correct at 1.5, thank you again. I can do one other thing while I'm waiting for this to dry. My axis of symmetry still will be the x value of my vertex. So we got that part. Since my graph opens down, I know that my vertex will be at the top, so it'll be a max. And now here's what we don't talk about often, though. The y-intercept. The y-intercept, remember, is just 0 in your c value. Now, what if I forget that? Can I still figure it out somehow? Sure. I still could look at the chart and just go to where x is 0. And there's the y equals 2, so I could do it that way. All right, should be dry now. So minus 1 each way, so I go this way, and add 1 as I move down. That's much better. Okay. So again, we're back to our original problem. We need help. How am I going to get all these values? Oh, wait. How would I get this one? Oh, yeah. If I just use the trace function, I can punch any number I want in for x. Let's say 3.5. Hit enter. And remember, the ones that are each two away from the vertex have the same value. Okay. If I hit trace and I punch in 2.5. The ones that are each one away from my vertex have the same value. So see, just with a couple of quick button presses, I still got my values. Now, it, it took me a little bit longer this way, but it's still not anything that's going to cause me too much grief here. I get my parabola that opens downward. So don't let the decimals throw you off. And then domain and range. That's really no different than it has been. Domain's still negative infinity to infinity. And range is still bottom to top. So it goes down forever. You're like, um, remember y value of your vertex is going to help you with your range. 6.5. That problem right there is probably as bad as it's going to get. So if you can survive that one, you're, you're in pretty darn good shape. Just to make sure. We'll switch over here. So number four, same thing's going on. Again, probably good to jot down my A, B, and C values. My X value is still going to be the same as before. Opposite of B, this time it's negative 8, so the opposite of that is 8 over 2 times A. 2 times 1 is 2, so 8 divided by 2 is 4. There's the x value of my vertex. Now, this time I'm a little bit happier because the x value is a whole number, so I'm not going to have to play the trace game necessarily, even though I could. If I find 4 in the middle of my chart, negative 11 looks to be my y value. And while I'm at it, and I see my symmetry, I might as well make the rest of my chart while I'm here. That's pretty slick. Oh, 
But now we have multiple tools to use. We have the trace function and we have the chart to be able to do this with. So I'll go ahead, I'll get these plotted. And now I can answer all the rest of my stuff. My axis of symmetry is still the x value of my vertex. My vertex is at the bottom of my graph, so it's a minimum. My y-intercept, again, I have choices. If I remember that it's just the c value at the end, that's great. If I don't remember that, as long as I remember the intercept is when x equals 0, I can still find it on the chart. And then I got the easiest question of all. My domain, again, forever left and right. And range, just keep repeating it to yourself, bottom to top. Bottom, y value of my vertex. To top which is infinity, infinity, infinity. As long as you just keep trekking through and using the tools that you've got, these really, these really aren't too bad to have to deal with. Okay, any other questions before we head to the back here? I'm assuming I haven't done anything too dingy since nobody else is raising their hand or smiling at me. Okay. All right, let's flip over then. All right, name the transformations from the parent graph transformations, shifts, you know, left, right, up, down, stretch, flip, any of those things. So just a couple of reminders as we're doing this. Again, any values inside the parentheses, that's my left and right, but it's the opposite of what we might think. Because again, it's x minus or x opposite of h. The plus 1 is my up and down, but that actually is what we would think. The up is plus and the down is minus. And then the last one is if my a value is different, that's what we call a stretch. Is it going to stretch out or is it going to get skinny on me? And if it's negative, it could be a flip because remember when it was negative, it meant it's opening down. Instead of opening up, we open down. So with all that working, looks like I got three things that are going on this time. So I got three blanks. So let's see. Looks like we've got a stretch three. So we've got a number in front that's not just one. It looks like we've got a right four. <laughs> And it looks like we have an up one. So I'll give you the number of blanks to kind of let you think about it here. So, hmm, what about six? Because I see two blanks there. What's one of the shifts or transformations that we've got working here? Either that negative in front of the x squared or the minus six. What does it mean? Okay, so the minus 6 is down 6, and that a value being negative 1 in front means my graph's going to flip. In other words, it's going to go from opening up to opening down. And you could even say opens down, I guess, if you didn't want to say flip, but it, it's not a big deal. So, and then I got a little ahead of myself here on number 7. So number seven gets us back into what we were doing yesterday. Ball is dropped from the top of the building. The distance meters above the ground of the ball after t seconds can be modeled by this equation. Find the y-intercept of the function. Now we just got done saying it's the value here at the end. Or if I don't remember, it's that c value. Okay. The y-intercept occurs when x equals 0, or in this case, t. So if I were to plug that in where the t squared was and simplify it, 0 squared is 0. 
0 times negative 9.8, still 0 last time I checked, plus 45 would still get me the same y-intercept. So whether I plug in a 0 or I remember that c is 45, it doesn't matter on this point. Okay, so that y-intercept Okay, that's the starting point for my graph. So in other words, if this was the actual problem that I had, what I'm saying is this building must be 45 meters above the ground. This is where I start. That's always the starting value when I'm looking at something in standard form. Okay, it's my starting point, my starting place, my starting value, whatever you want to say there. The x-intercept, or zero, now this one we're going to have to go back to the calculator for. Okay, so this is when my y value equals 0. I can't use the chart and I can't use trace for this. But remember, we've got our cheat sheet here now. So when I'm trying to find the 0 this time, I'm just going to put this over this long enough so we can see where we're starting here. So negative 9.8x squared plus 45. Once I do that, I'm going to hit graph, try to get rid of the glare, there we go, and again, I'm going to hit second, trace, and I want number two, I'm trying to find the zero, I'm trying to find the intercept, and remember, sometimes our cursor may disappear, so normally, I'm going to watch my y value, and I'm hitting right, as long as I see the y value is going down, I'm going to keep hitting right until I see my little cursor guy show up here. There he is. And my goal is I'm trying to get as close to the x-axis as I can. That's pretty close right there. So once I get there, I'm going to go left, one, two, three arrow clicks. I'm going to hit enter. There's my little arrow marking that I've hit enter, my little faint line. Then I'm going to go right six arrows. Now again, the first three are to get me back where I started. And then one, two, three more to hit enter. And notice now I see arrows on both sides and they're trapping in the point I'm trying to find. I hit enter one last time. And the x value, 2.14, is my x-intercept. The significance of that point is when is the time of when the ball in this case hits the ground. Remember, x is time, y is height when we're talking about these application problems. So again, that's why kind of getting practice with this is a little bit important, but you've got your help sheet to kind of back up. But you still need to understand what it is you're looking for to even know which steps to use on those. Okay. All right. For each function, find the y-intercept. Okay. Depends on how it's written. If it's in standard form, you can just use your c-value. Or if I forget, I can look it up on the chart. I can do the same thing on this one. Don't make life hard. Because there's two ways I can actually do this one. That's the cool thing. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. You just got to find one you can remember. I could type this in, because remember, the y-intercept means when x is 0. I could look on the chart. Oh, when it's x is 0, y is 7. I could do it that way. I could hit trace if I forgot about the chart and just type in 0, zero 07. Okay, that works. Or I could even just plug in 0 for x and solve it myself. They all would work. Okay, but that's what y intercepts are those starting points. Now I'm going to make you think. If I give you a vertex for a given parabola, is there only one equation you can create? Why or why not? Okay, so let's say I give you a vertex. Let's make one up here and say that the vertex is 1, 4. And I said, make your equation for it. 
And you're like, okay, here's what a vertex equation looks like for this. So y equals x opposite of h squared plus k. Okay, there's my equation. Is there any way in not messing with the vertex, so I can't mess with the one or four, that I can make a different graph out of this? Normally when I ask these questions, the answer isn't going to be no, the answer will be yes. So here's what I've got to keep in mind. My A value on this one is one. Well, we said before, if the A value changes, it can stretch it, shrink it, do whatever. So if I just change the A value, making it 2 is actually going to make my graph get skinnier. Still has the same vertex, but it has a different A value. That's all you would have to show me. You could even go just so far as to say, I just need to change the A value. That would be enough. But that's just understanding, again, how I can take something that's got the same starting point and change the way that it looks a little bit. Again, you know how similar I get with some of these things, so just something you may want to take a peek at. All right, one more app. We get an equation that gives the height of the ball in feet above the ground at t seconds after the ball is thrown upward. How many seconds after the ball is thrown will it reach its maximum height? What is the maximum height. Okay, remember, maximum height is your y value when we find our vertex here in a minute at x seconds. So I gotta find that vertex. So remember, I've got my a, I've got my b and my c here. So to find the x value of any vertex, I have my little mini formula. Got my little thing here, x equals negative b over 2a. So x equals the opposite of b over 2 times a. Again, clean up that denominator. Don't try typing everything at once and get some weird, funky answer. So it's going to take a whole speedy one second, it looks like, to get to the maximum height here. But I guess when we're throwing it, that makes sense. And then to get my y, I can plug the 1 in where those two t's are. That would work. Or bust out my handy-dandy calculator. Type in my expression. And since I know what the x value is, I can look at the chart if I want to. When x is 1, y is 21. I could use the trace function. Okay, they all work. I just got to know what it is that I'm looking for. And that's what I mean when you say you've got to go back over and look at some of this stuff. Because I'm not answering this tomorrow. Well, which one's feet? Not telling you. Well, how to? Not telling you. Because there's, there's enough things you've got to kind of help you with those things to make this work. All right, last part. Calculate the focus and directrix for the following quadratics. Okay. So this is the one where we have our big old sheet of things. But the easiest way to remember is to start, where's your vertex at? Well, here... I'd start at negative 4, 0. Because again, it's opposite of what's inside, and then that value on the outside. Once I have that, you're like, they didn't ask me for the vertex. What do I need that for? Because now I notice my vertex is not centered at the origin. So I know which equation to use. And the vertex tells me what h and k is. And I can look and see there's no value in front, so I know my A value is 1. Once I have this, now I'm ready to roll. So my focus is H, I'll do it down here too, H, K plus 
1 over 4 times a. Now, I can't leave it that way. I need to simplify this part. So just like we've been doing on the rest, multiply these together first. 4 times 1 is 4. So 0 plus 1 fourth is 1 fourth. And if you typed it in and got 0.25, that's fine. For my directrix, again, I go back to my handy dandy sheet. K minus 1 over 4a. Okay. So y equals k minus 1 over 4k. 4 times 1 is 4, which gives me 1 fourth or 0.25, but it's minus this time. So it would be negative 1 fourth or negative 0.25. And I'm good with that. So basically, if we can plug into a formula, we're good. And then the last one, I don't see any parentheses, so I know that part's zero. I don't see any pluses or minuses. That part's zero. So if my vertex is at the origin, my focus is zero, one over four a. Okay, so let's see, zero, one over four, my a value is negative two. Four times negative two is negative eight. It's negative one eighth or negative 0.125 if you want to go that route. And finally, my directrix, y equals negative one over four a, because again, we're at the origin. Okay, y equals negative 1 over 4 times negative 2. Ooh, be careful. You're like, why be careful? Because I have a double negative. I have a negative on the 1. I have a negative down in the denominator. Negative divided by negative is positive. Oh. Never guess my questions are going to be on the quiz tomorrow. 13. So, you've got one in front of you. Again, as I've said before, if you want an extra copy, they're in the folder. You can take one for that. There will be a video up with a couple more of the application problems, like number 7 and 11, in case you need to look something over again, kind of think through something again. You can do that. 